Good day, everyone. The Association of State Dam Safety Officials is pleased to present this online education program. This program is entitled, Identify Hazards and Improving Public Safety at Low Head Dam. Our speakers today are Paul Schweiger and Dr. Bruce Schantz. We are very pleased to welcome all of you to this program. My name is Sean, and I will be the moderator for today's seminar. Please note that today's call is being recorded, and all participant lines are muted. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Paul Schweiger is a Vice President of Gannett Fleming Incorporated and Principal Project Manager in the firm's dam and hydraulic section. He has 28 years of experience working on dams and flood control projects. Paul's technical specialties include hydrologic and hydraulic analyses for dams, conducting dam assessments, dam rehabilitation, and designing fish passage facilities. Paul is an approved FERC facilitator for performing failure mode analysis exercises for dams regularly conducted by dam owners and other training safety seminars for ASDSO. Dr. Bruce A. Schantz, PE, is Professor Emeritus in the University of Tennessee's Civil and Environmental Engineering Department, where he taught water resources engineering for 37 years. Dr. Schantz is currently a senior research associate for the Tennessee Water Resources Research Center and a consulting engineer in Knoxville. In 1980, he served as the first chief of FEMA's Office of Federal Dam Safety and has written numerous articles on the hydraulics and public safety at Low Dam Head. Dr. Schantz is an honorary member in ASDSO, an ASCE fellow, and is a registered engineer in Tennessee, Ohio, Virginia, and Alabama. Welcome to the program. Let's get started. Okay. Hi. Thank you, Sean, for your introduction. I'm Bruce, and I'll be presenting the first part. Uh, my part one includes an introduction to our topic and then on to some related hydraulics. Uh, Paul, my partner here, will draw from his broad experience to focus mostly on practice alternatives for reducing the risk and hazard around our topic, uh, which is low head dams. Our, our presentations are, are really um, only a big picture uh, overview of this topic. I could easily spend, I guess, a half day on, on the hydraulics alone. And I know Paul uh, personally, and I know that he, he could use uh, probably up to a full day just on practices alone to, uh, for reducing the hazard. Uh, let's go on to our slides here. Uh, as I said, I'm going to be talking about the background and theory, and Paul will be talking about the practice. I'd like to draw your attention to um, this slide and the next one. Uh, these are two publications from which a large part of both our presentations are based. Um, both are listed on one of uh, Paul's last slides in his presentation, and also in the reference list handout under the links tab that the chart that our host Sean mentioned earlier. Uh, I I will mention. Um, in that reference list, uh, if you have already looked at that and downloaded or will, pay particular attention to uh, references number 3, 8, 16, 27, and 29. And what you're looking at right now is uh, my reference 29. Uh, Paul's reference is number 27. So, so just have that out uh, if, you, uh, if you're going to uh, download that link, for at least for my part. Paul's uh, uh, publication, Saving Lives While Improving Fish Passage at Killer Dams, was uh, published by ASDSO in the Journal of Dam Safety, the, the next uh, edition or issue after mine. So we'll be drawing from these uh, in, our, in our presentations. And if you, uh, if you miss something or, or uh, you're interested in particular details, uh, as far as my presentation is concerned, you can always go to uh, that that number uh, 29 reference uh, and and uh, get more details. Okay, let's go on then to uh, back a little bit about uh, background. Um, I'm going to be talking about, uh, of course, low head dams. I'll try to characterize these creatures in terms of what they are and what they aren't, and what makes them so dangerous. 
Then I'm going to present a national perspective on the dimensions, what I call the dimensions uh, of, of public safety around these, these, these dams. The first picture you see here uh, on this slide is the TDA North Dam spilling uh, during, uh, on the Clinch River in, uh, in my own state of Tennessee uh, during a rare spill in 2011. The reason I present this is to contrast this with the type of dams that we're going to be talking about, smaller dams, dams that are, that are uh, low-head dams, and this certainly isn't any low-head dam. Um, this is one of some 87,000 federal dams uh, and, and non-federal dams. Uh, there are about 4% of those that are federal dams and the rest of them are non-federal. So most of the dams of these 87,000 are, are non-federal dams that are mostly regulated by, by the, uh, the 50 states. Now one thing that distinguishes blowhead dams, which I'll be talking about from their bigger brothers and sisters, is that they have no gates or controls like the one you see here. The uh, distribution of these 87,000 dams, as you can see here, is, is largely concentrated in the eastern half of the U.S., although there's a scattering uh, of dams uh, in the west as well. So we're going to be talking about none of these dams, but uh, much, much, much smaller dams. Um, I present this chart here uh, as, as sort of a background or a segue in, in contrast to, uh, to uh, what we'll be talking about in terms of low-head dams. What you're looking at here is a distribution of dam failures, of U.S. dam failures by decade from the, in the last 150 years or so. There have been some 300 failures uh, in this country. Uh, we kind of rocked along there for about almost 100 years with uh, just a few uh, failures. Uh, and then in the last uh, 40, 50 years, we've had, we've had several uh, failures. Uh, and around the 1970s, when the uh, Buffalo Creek Tails, Tailings Dam failed, Teton Dam failed, Kelly Barnes Dam failed, and Laurel Run uh, in Johnstown, Pennsylvania failed, all these in the 1970s, uh, uh, dam safety has been certainly in the, in the topical forefront. Uh, I want to draw your attention to the... Uh, this bar here, in the 1990s, when there were some 94 dams uh, uh, failed, most of the dams that failed in that case, and in fact about half of them, over half of them, at least 60, failed in two states, in North Carolina and uh, Virginia, as a result of Hurricane Floyd that went up the uh, east coast there. Uh, not only these two states, but uh, two or three other states accounted for almost all of these uh, 94. So that's kind of an anomaly. Uh, in, the, in the next uh, uh, bar, uh, 2000 uh, to 2009, where you see 77 uh, failures, almost all of those were due to uh, just a few very, very large uh, storms uh, that made, also made its way up through the, coast, the eastern coast as well as in the central part of the U.S. So <clears throat> these, two, uh, these two bars are, are I, I would consider them to be anomalies uh, because starting in the 1970s when we started implementing uh, some of our programs in, uh, in dam safety. Uh, uh, a lot of progress has been made both by the states and the federal levels to make dams safer. Uh, organizations in the U.S. such as ASDSO, uh, one of the sponsors of, of this webinar, USSD, and, and also in Canada, the, the Canadian Dam Association, have done a great deal to promote the safety of dams, and, and, the, and I want to emphasize of dams, of structural safety of the dams to reduce damage and also fatalities in the event of uh, failure. Uh, there are a few things that come to mind, and these include uh, state programs and regulations. Uh, a lot of work has been done in, in federal agency coordination. Uh, Interagency Committee on Dam Safety has done a great deal to, uh, uh, to promote uh, dam safety among the 20 or 22 federal agencies. Uh, to prevent such things as Teton Dam uh, again in the future, or at least to reduce the, the risk of Teton failing. Uh, and also such things as workshops and conferences and webinars like this. Uh, since 1970 and, uh, and all those failures uh, during that decade, uh, the, there's been a vastly improved technology, technical guidelines, standards, and design, construction, operation, maintenance 
inspection and even emergency response to failure. And, 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 and in all, I think there's been a, a greater accountability in terms of dam safety, greater owner responsibility. And I want to remind everyone that the dam owners are responsible for the safety of dams. But uh, why do I say all this? Because uh, what's been missing in all these programs is a nationally coordinated effort for protecting the public at or around, not of, but at or around the smaller structures, mainly because they fall below uh, federal uh, uh, classification or state regulated categories. So we're really talking about the, uh, the smaller uh, types of dams. There are literally thousands of these smaller dams from a few feet to perhaps maybe 10 or 15 feet high constructed, constructed across rivers and, and streams in the U.S. Uh, now I'd like to show you a series of, um, I think about three slides, <clears throat> um, of what I would call maybe typical, maybe representatively typical small low head dams that were built across the country during mostly during the 18th and 19th, 19th century uh, as water power mill dams for grinding corn and grains and powering sawmills, cotton mills, and other types of factors, part of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, many of these also have been built during the, the last century, during the 1900s, for water supply and hydroelectric power purposes. And, of course, most of the power uh, dams, the smaller dams, are, are regulated by the FERC. Uh, so what you're looking at here uh, on the left is uh, what I would call a conventional, typical uh, low-head dam uh, in the heart of uh, Des Moines, Iowa, on the Des Moines River. Uh, this dam has seen uh, some four or five incidents uh, with as many, uh, as many deaths And what you're looking at here. I don't know if you can see that from your, where you're all sitting, but a dr rather dramatic rescue of a woman who went over with her husband uh, in a boat. Um, I think the boat had stalled. Uh, they ended up over the dam. Um, the overfall uh, capsized the, their boat. They both flipped out of the water and got caught in the, uh, the churn below the, uh, below the overfall. Uh, a real tragic uh, situation at that point. Uh, also on the right-hand side, you'll see uh, uh, Milford, uh, excuse me, Rockford uh, Mill Dam on the Little River near where I live here at the foothills of the uh, Smoky Mountains. Um, there have been about four or five incidences here where as many people have, have died. Uh, some people have not gone over the dam. Some of them have... Uh, traversed uh, upstream, got to, especially anglers from their boats, fishing and got trapped in the, uh, the reverse velocity uh, from, um, from downstream to the uh, point of overfall of the dam. Um, low head dams are typically, uh, as I say here, uh, weir-like structures, usually uh, built completely across the, uh, the entire river, usually made out of concrete or stone masonry. They may have an OG uh, uh, form, or they may just be uh, like a plate, uh, maybe a one-foot uh, uh, wide concrete uh, overfall. Uh, and when we talk about low head dams, we're talking usually about uh, structures of less than uh, 15 feet high, but they may be as low as, as a foot or two. These can be equally dangerous. Um, another point that I want to make here is a lot of these, these dams, these low head dams, are, just, are a result of construction of many mill dams. Uh, across the country. And I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes. But I wanted to show you uh, some pictures here of less conventional, less typical uh, structures that act like or produce the same hydraulic effects as low head dams. The one you see here in the upper left hand corner uh, is a, an outlet structure from a box culvert underneath the, uh, underneath the highway. This happens to be in Salt Lake County, Utah. Uh, this this particular uh, uh, structure here has claimed some lives. Uh, on the lower left-hand corner, uh, you'll see uh, another structure. This is actually a, a, uh, an auxiliary spillway formed by an OG, sort of a, an S-type uh, geometry. Water flows over here really smoothly and, uh, and goes down into, uh, uh, into, the, tail, into the, uh, the receiving stream. Uh, people have died in this one. I'm going to talk about that one, too. But there's also another uh, unconventional type of structure, uh, the one on the lower right-hand corner here uh, on the Kings River in uh, California. This happens to be a gauging station. Of course, a gauging station, by definition, is uh, to, to uh, 
narrow the water down uh, into a, a, a channel or a weir to form critical flow so that, uh, so that the stage can be related to the discharge. But in doing so, in going through critical flow, uh, downstream from that, as the water flows over it, it becomes supercritical. And when it becomes supercritical, uh, it, it also uh, forms a hydraulic jump that we'll be talking about, uh, forming the same kind of dangerous hydraulic effect that some of those other uh, more conventional dams that I showed you in the previous slide uh, form. Uh, there's also, if you look in the upper left-hand corner here, a drop structure in, on Walnut Creek uh, in uh, Contra Costa Cal County, California, that has taken uh, several lives. This is an urban area, and uh, lots of kids play in the river. They float down in their tubes, and during certain periods of flow, particularly during high flow, uh, this, this particular drop structure drops to a point where it actually creates a really dangerous situation. And so all of these produce uh, uh, the effects of, uh, of low head dams, even though they may not be called that. Um, take a look at the, uh, this picture here. Uh, oh, not too far. Uh, this picture here is, is probably the most unconventional uh, type of dam. Uh, as a, uh, this is a natural setting where the water below a hydroelectric power producing plant uh, discharges water downstream, and it happens to go through this particular narrows. Uh, see if I can pinpoint that. This narrows here. And what you're looking at on the left is this narrows during very low flow, uh, just a, a shortly after the turbine flow was released, uh, about two and a half miles upstream. So water really hasn't um, gained its full, uh, uh, full flow yet. But on the right-hand side here, uh, three hours afterwards, uh, we've reached pretty much steady flow. And this, I, I tell you that, uh, that this particular river flows into a lake at this point here. And so this, is, this river flows into this lake, and the lake acts as backwater. Under certain flow conditions, under these natural, this natural narrows, uh, we also produce, uh, it can also produce the effect of a, a very dangerous submerged hydraulic jump. And I tell you that uh, uh, some four or five men that were going upstream at this point capsized when they reached this point where you see the yellow arrow, uh, capsized at this point, uh, dumping all four of them into the water. And it doesn't really look really dangerous uh, because the water drop is only like 20 inches at this point. But it was enough, uh, it was enough, uh, created enough force and velocity uh, to really create a, a scary situation. In fact, uh, one person died as a result of being uh, trapped in the, uh, in the turning water right, right at the, uh, the point uh, of the arrow that you see there. OK, uh, I mentioned that a lot of these structures are a result of old abandoned uh, uh, mill dams. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of de detail here. But I wanted to show you, give you some idea uh, of the magnitude of, of, the, uh, of the situation in terms of how many of these structures uh, there are out there that can cause potential problems. Um, what you're looking at here, these, bubble, uh, these bubbles represent densities of mills per 100 square miles, uh, 100, 100 square kilometers, excuse me, uh, to convert to uh, square miles divided by about two and a half. So you can look at these as mills per uh, 40 square miles, um, along with the number of counties in the in the entire uh, eastern half of the U.S. So uh, mills per 40 square miles, uh, eight mills per 40 square miles would be uh, roughly one watt every uh, every five square miles. So in counties like mine in Knox County, 500 square miles, uh, 100 uh, mill dams is is, is pretty common. And that's multiplied, of course, uh, across all 3,000 or so counties across the U.S., particularly in the, in the eastern part. So uh, the researchers that did this from Franklin and uh, Marshall College, I think that's in Pennsylvania, uh, determined that there were some 65,000 water-powered mills uh, from the 1840 U.S. Census. Now, I'm not suggesting that all these uh, water-powered mills, mill dams, are in existence, but it, even if five or, or 10 percent of these are existence, existing today. We're talking about three to maybe 10,000 uh, mill dams uh, in the eastern part of the U.S. Uh, the, next, uh, the next slide here, 
shows a uh, kind of a close-up uh, view when they looked at just three counties. Uh, one of our uh, our next speaker, Paul, is from Pennsylvania, and he'd be interested in this. Uh, that in just three counties uh, of southeastern Pennsylvania, uh, these researchers have discovered some 1,025 mill dams that were built in the from about 1847 to 1876. That's a lot of dams. Um, Again, not all these are in existence. This is a, a maybe a, a prettier picture, a clearer picture of what we're talking about in terms of density. These are also in mils per square uh, kilometer. Um, so uh, point, point 0.2 uh, dams, uh, mil dams per per square kilometer, such as given by the orange here, would be, uh, uh, what I say, point 0.2 uh, would be uh, two and a half times that would be point 0.5 uh, mills per square mile. So you notice here that the redder the colors, the more dense they are, particularly up in the uh, in the northeast of New England, which is no surprise where there are many, many old and abandoned mill dams and still existing, down through Pennsylvania, including Ohio, uh, uh, down through uh, uh, Virginia, and even to my own state uh, in, in Tennessee, going down through uh, North Carolina, even into Georgia, a lot of these uh, these mill dams. Uh, who knows how many of them are left, but for sure there are many of them uh, left. Uh, so that gives you some idea of the potential that these things have. Uh, there are many references to accidents. The earliest one I could find is in 1858 in Cleveland, near Cleveland, Ohio, up in Jogger County, northeastern part of the state, where uh, boys, uh, a couple of boys uh, escaped, uh, I think there were four of them that escaped drowning in one of these mill dams. Uh, in an 1892 uh, uh, reference that I found, uh, some I believe five five out of six boys uh, lost their lives uh, at this particular uh, dam on the Deerfield River. So there have been early references to uh, uh, to uh, deaths at these. Another thing that distinguishes Lowhead Dam um, dams from from um, our, the larger dams that we've been talking about that are that are regulated is that when when a large dam fails and it kills people, usually it's in the dozens or maybe even hundreds or even thousands uh, if we go back to the Johnstown flood. But in the case of low-head dams, most of, the, uh, most of the deaths are in the one or two range. They don't make the national headlines, and they're usually restricted the new, to, to the local news, uh, newscast, maybe in the, the nearest town or city, and maybe a, a small article in a local, uh, in a local paper. Um, there's, there's not a lot of attention paid to uh, deaths at these. So people, people die at these dams at a, at a very alarming rate, as I'll show you uh, a little bit later here. And uh, we need to pay attention to these. Um, so who owns these dams? Well, <laughs> unfortunately, in some cases, um, there aren't any owners, or at least uh, the accountability is pretty low. Uh, in some cases, uh, if there's a drowning, uh, a lot of times these rivers across the country separate different jurisdictions. And so if there's a drowning, um, it, it becomes an issue of who's responsible for the safety, the public safety around that dam, and usually gets resolved uh, during a lawsuit. Uh, most of these dams are probably owned by private owners. Uh, some are owned by municipalities, some by states, federal government. Uh, uh, industries and corporations uh, own these. Uh, uh, in some cases, uh, they're actually shared. I'm, I'm aware of one structure uh, in a river uh, where the state owns the river, the, a city owns the bridge and all the downstream uh, uh, banks along the river, both sides of the river, but it has jurisdiction uh, downstream over the bridge. Uh, a private owner owns a property along the, uh, the upstream, uh, the left abutment uh, upstream approach. Uh, a city, another, a second city owns, has jurisdiction over this area, and then a third city has jurisdiction on the right bank, uh, 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 going downstream, looking on the on the right hand side. So, uh, so who's uh, responsible? How do you how do you sort out the responsibility for public safety at these types uh, of uh, structures? And by the way, what you're looking at here is uh, several people have died at this particular structure uh, in uh, Virginia. Um, it's a very, very dangerous uh, situation that I understand is, is being resolved uh, 
uh, today. So what makes these, these guys so dangerous? Um, mainly because of their small size. They don't appear to be dangerous to most people that use these. Um, here we see somebody in the, uh, actually a father in the middle of, uh, of the river. His son has already drowned, and uh, he's at loss here as to what he's going to do next. And eventually he was, uh, he was uh, 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 rescued. Next, one thing that makes them so dangerous is that the, the danger is hidden. Uh, here you see, and uh, most people see this as a nice uh, overfall. It's smooth. It's glassy. It doesn't look dangerous at all. And you notice he's only up into water up to his waist. So to most people, this is not really a dangerous situation. Uh, so most of the danger is due to uh, uh, submerged conditions, submerged forces, submerged velocities, uh, submerged currents, rotations, and so on. Uh, so there's a deception here uh, by a lot of people in how they, how they see these things. They're also difficult to escape from. Uh, the reason is, I'll show you a little later, uh, as water falls over, uh, water weighs over 60 pounds a cubic foot, and combined with velocity in terms of its impulse momentum, it's, uh, it's the weight times the velocity squared. So it doesn't take much velocity to, uh, to produce hundreds of pounds of force acting on top of uh, somebody's head or torso underneath here. And then another thing is rescuers uh, themselves become victims. Uh, I've documented many, many cases, dozens of cases where rescuers have, have become the victim or victims along with uh, the ones that are trying to be rescued. Another problem is that you notice in, in this area here, uh, it's, it's, it's white water. It attracts, <laughs> it attracts a lot of kayakers and paddlers because of the white water. But because it is white water, it's highly aerated. And uh, as a matter of fact, this, this high aeration reduces the buoyancy by about 30%. So if a person, let's say, ideally is, is neutrally buoyant, uh, he's going to naturally sink uh, in water uh, that's highly aerated like this. And, and usually when uh, the most dangerous conditions occur well, during the higher flows, and during the higher flows is usually during uh, a rain, high runoff, high rainfall conditions where the water is cooler. And therefore, the, uh, the possibility uh, and uh, the possibility of hypothermia is greatest. So you've got all these things uh, combining to really form a dangerous situation. Not only that, but uh, logs and drums and tires and everything gets caught in, the, uh, uh, in this section down here. And uh, so when somebody gets trapped in there, they, they keep rolling around uh, like in a washing machine, get bumped into these objects, and including the dam itself. They, they quickly become disoriented. And, uh, and lose control of their, uh, their faculties and, and pretty much within five minutes just give up. There's also one other problem that makes these so, so dangerous. Somebody that goes out there one week and enjoys themselves, uh, takes their kids out and maybe even swims in the area where they see this man, goes back the next week and the whole family drowns. Why? Because the flow has changed, it's increased, uh, creating uh, dangerous conditions. So it may be safe one day and, and not safe the next, as is, is the situation you see here in this picture. Uh, what you're seeing here is a young man going down, actually sliding down the, uh, uh, the spillway here, and he's on his way to death, uh, and another um, statistic fatality. Um, what he was doing is showing his parents here how he went down the day before and safely uh, enjoyed himself swimming. But on this day, uh, it had been raining the whole week, and it rained the night before quite a bit, increasing the water flow, uh, doubling or tripping it. And what he didn't know was uh, between last, between the day before and the day that you see him going down here, is that a very dangerous situation or hydraulic form, and he was unable to get out. As a matter of fact, uh, the man that you see here uh, tried to rescue him, and the net result was a sad uh, ending where both of them actually ended up drowning. So variable flow is an issue uh, that a lot of people uh, ignore, and they're not really equipped technically to, to understand. From a national perspective, I've done quite a bit of uh, study on incidents. I've documented drownings. I've looked at uh, how these drownings occur across the U.S. Uh, um, I've compared them with uh, dam failure deaths. We've paid a lot of attention to dam failures over the last several decades and deaths at dams, and we've done a pretty good job, even though the number of failures increased and peaked there in the 90s. 
uh, the number of deaths has gone down because of the technology and the and our emergency response system and, and a lot of things that have been um, that, that we see uh, have been put into place by states and the federal government uh, over the last three or four uh, decades. Uh, and I'll also talk about some of the drowning circumstances. Um, so let's take a look. Uh, I guess most of you folks out there. Uh, Probably, most likely, in any audience that's sitting uh, watching this, uh, a handful of you are interested in uh, water sports, maybe kayaking or paddling, uh, canoeing, uh, rafting, tubing, and I understand that uh, paddle boards are becoming more and more uh, uh, in use and vogue uh, these days. Uh, paddle sports is a big industry. I'm not going to talk about everything here that's on this slide, but. The bottom line is that paddle sports are a big industry in this country, and more and more, it's really a growth industry. Uh, as I say here, 33% increase in paddle sports since 2006. That's that's from a 2012 report. Um, it's a it's a major uh, uh, impact on our our economy as well. Now let's look at drownings uh, from my studies uh, across the country. Uh, I've determined that as of uh, the date of when I produced this slide, which is the end of August of this year, there are 276 fatalities at uh, 2000, uh, uh, 207 incidents, incidents uh, as you see here. And I've, I've graded these by, uh, by uh, color. You notice that three states here, Minnesota, Iowa, and Pennsylvania, which are in red, um, account for quite a few, uh, few deaths. At least uh, they're in the category of at least 21 or more deaths uh, during the, from the 1960s until the current. Um, Iowa, Minnesota, Pennsylvania uh, account for over 100 of these uh, 276 fatalities, 100 alone uh, from these, just these three states. And then Virginia, Illinois, and Virginia account for, uh, I don't know, some 50 or so. So a handful of states, and you notice that these are states that pretty much coincide with that uh, that uh, band of um, lowhead dams that I showed you and mill dams uh, across the country in an earlier slide. In my own state of Tennessee, uh, we've had some 13 uh, deaths in about five instances. And you notice that uh, almost all states have had uh, problems uh, in terms of fatalities. In fact, about uh, 39 states uh, from my work, from my study, have had uh, uh, have had uh, at least one fatality. Most of them have had a couple. Uh, this, so this is from my study. I want to draw your attention to uh, some work that's being done by a friend, by a friend and former colleague from the University of Tennessee, and now at uh, Brigham Young University in Utah, Dr. Roland Hotchkiss, and his uh, grad student, who maintain a, a website on the on locations of fatalities that submerge hydraulic jumps. Uh, he has uh, documented some, almost 400 fatalities at 204 sites, leaving about uh, two fatalities per site. And, that, and that's what I have found, that m many, many of these sites have experienced multiple fatalities without anything being really done in terms of ameliorating or, uh, or reducing, the, uh, reducing the hazard, or for that matter, reducing the risk. Uh, I suggest that after uh, this webinar, you go online and check this out and uh, and take a look at some of these, maybe in your own uh, location. Uh, these also include mine, my data. I furnished his my data to him, and he's done some further work. So somewhere between maybe three and four hundred fatalities in the last uh, what maybe fifty years. <clears throat> Uh, further uh, study that I've done uh, uh, in terms of documented drownings at lowhead dams. Um, but what this shows you here is uh, I've got a. I think I, I just discovered a, a, a mistake here. That says documented drownings at lowhead dams. That should be documented dry, drownings at just dams in the U.S., not lowhead dams. I don't know how I missed that. Anyway, I apologize for that. Uh, in the wait, excuse me. I'm sorry. Yeah, this is uh, documented drownings at Lowhead Dams. I'll get it right here. 
from 1960 through uh, August of 2013. Uh, you notice a steady increase uh, from the 1960s up to the to the present here, uh, where just in the last three three years, uh, I've documented uh, uh, some 61 uh, some 61 deaths, um, and and uh, the number of deaths seems to be accelerating, probably because of increased. Uh, uh, water sports uh, by many people around the country. Now, in contrast to that, I want to show you the next slide, which I thought I was looking at, uh, is the decade-by-decade decade, uh, uh, summary of deaths from dam failures. The last one was from deaths at lowhead dams. This is at, at, uh, at below dams that have failed. And I, let's take a quick look at the last uh, four or five decades here and put these together. So we're going to combine the number of deaths at low-head dams to those uh, resulting from dam failures from the 1960s. So the blue here represents uh, dam failure deaths. Uh, notice that that's decreasing, decreasing, decreasing from 258 uh, in the 1970s from those four or five failures that I mentioned earlier uh, to only nine in the last 13 years. But notice that uh, uh, from the 1970s to, to the current, uh, that there's been a steady, almost dramatic increase, accelerated increase in the number of deaths at lowhead dams. There have been only 40 deaths, which I find incredible, given the number of failures we've had, uh, only 40 deaths at, uh, as a result of dam failures, but 248 deaths since, the ninth, since uh, in the last four decades as a result of lowhead uh, dams. So there's been about a 6 to 1 ratio of deaths or fatalities as a result of uh, uh, deaths at, uh, at uh, low head dams compared to uh, uh, fatalities below uh, dams that have failed. Uh, what were they doing when they, uh, when they were drowning? Well, in summary, most of them were, were floating uh, using some, uh, some kind of paddle sports. About half of them were either canoeing, boating, uh, floating, or, or kayaking. Uh, another interesting uh, uh, question that comes up, does it really matter whether the victims are wearing a, uh, a life vest or not, personal flotation device or PFD? Uh, based on what we know, whether or not we knew for sure they were wearing one or whether they were not wearing one, uh, about, we knew about out of the, the 276 drownings, I knew for sure that, that 89 of them, or 90 if you count a float, float cushion, either were or were not wearing a uh, PFD. Uh, and you notice that it's a fairly even split, uh, whether you're wearing a, a, a vest or, uh, or not wearing a vest. Uh, I'm not suggesting here that you go in the water not wearing a vest, but it's, it's interesting that um, the, the vest, uh, that, that's a pretty, uh, it's pretty much a, a toss-up of whether or not you're going to survive, uh, whether or not you wear a vest. <clears throat> what if you go over the dam? One of the most dreaded things, I guess, is finding yourself going over the dam when you didn't intend to go over the dam, particularly if your boat has stalled out upstream. Uh, from the data uh, that I have, uh, based on those that we know that went over the dam, um, about 57% of those that went over the dam and died were wearing a, a PFD, whereas only 43% uh, were wearing a P PFD. So, that's, that's a pretty even split also. Uh, again, uh, maybe it doesn't really matter when you end up in a, in a maelstrom or a, uh, a circulation pattern like this whether you're wearing one or not. Let's move along here quickly. Uh, so how, did, how does one fear if you go over a dam? Are you going to be injured? Uh, what's the odds? Uh, well, out of 131 incidents, incidents uh, you have a 70% chance of either drowning or being injured if you go over a dam. And not very good odds. So if you know there's something there, um, you know, you need a portage if you're paddling, if you have a chance. <clears throat> uh, in terms of gender and uh, age groups, by far the most uh, uh, frequent or, uh, age group of, of drownings is in, the, uh, is in the 30s. In fact, the median age for all genders is about 27. Uh, male is 28, female 23. And by far most of the drownees are... Uh, 
are male compared to, uh, to female. <clears throat> uh, as you might expect, and this is no, no surprise, most of the uh, droughtings took place during the two-day weekend. Uh, I, I mention this because uh, uh, if, if, there, if there is an enforcement program against using uh, uh, certain facilities or uh, at these particular sites, you want to, and I guess it makes sense, it's common sense to send your enforcement people out there uh, during the period of, of highest uses, and that would be uh, during the, uh, the two-day weekend. Uh, now let's switch to hydraulics and some examples. Uh, may have uh, time for at least one example. Um, the terminology, uh, jump conditions, forces, and, uh, and as I say, some examples. Uh, terminology, uh, you have a handout that, that you have access to under the linkage that, that Sean mentioned earlier. You might want to download that uh, and look at that maybe later. Uh, all of these terms apply to uh, submerged hydraulic jumps. I mentioned aeration. One important feature of a uh, submerged hydraulic jump, which we're talking about, is the boil or the boil line uh, at this point here. Uh, when water goes over a low head dam, it has very high velocities uh, of jet as it moves down to the bottom, and it continues that high velocity jet, separating itself from the surrounding uh, fluid. It's highly aerated, and pretty soon it loses its momentum uh, at about this point, and as it loses its momentum, that highly aerated water finally starts to uh, pretty much buoy, it, buoy itself up to the top like this, and it forms a kind of a, a high point. Well, this high point compared to this elevation over here uh, is higher, so there's going to be a backflow from this boil point to this dam, and that's what the that's that's another dangerous point. If you find yourself anywhere in this in the system here, uh, you're going to find yourself trapped in this never-ending uh, 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 circle uh, or vortex. Um, and the forces that one encounters at this point here are in the neighborhood of hundreds of pounds. The velocities that you encounter here in counter currents are uh, are in the neighborhood of five or six feet per second. Uh, and I want to show you uh, in, a, in a slide, uh, I think it's one of the next slides, how that compares with, uh, with athlete, uh, athletic swimmers, people who uh, do this for a living um, and who, uh, who are good swimmers. Uh, some of the other terms here are the hydraulic. This whole, this whole thing here between the dam and the boil is called the hydraulic. Um, the hydraulic jump here is a result of supercritical flow going over the top and, uh, and it, the hydraulic jump going from supercritical flow down here to subcritical flow is completely submerged by the tailwater, actually partially drowning out the jump, uh, forming a kind of a plunging uh, and, and uh, submerged hydraulic jump. Uh, some other terms here that we'll talk about a little bit later. I wanted to mention uh, uh, submergence while we're on this slide here uh, because the velocity uh, the counter velocity is a function of the submergence of the hydraulic jump. The submergence uh, is defined as the difference between the tail water depth here uh, as a result of fluid going down a channel from Manning's equation and the sequent depth as a result of the hydraulic jump jumping up to uh, its sequent depth. So the submergence is the difference between the tail water and the sequent depth of the hydraulic jump. Uh, divided by the uh, the sequent depth, and that's typically in the neighborhood of uh, uh, maybe 30 percent to uh, maybe 80, 85 percent. It gets above 80 percent. Excuse me, above about 87 percent when the tail water gets up to about 87 percent of of the headwater hill here. Uh, this tends to drown out the whole thing, and I'm going to show you here in a, in a slide here in a minute. Uh, before we do that, I want to talk to you about the forces that are acting on the human body, on the hydraulic, uh, from um, water overflowing at this point, surface, uh, reverse surface velocities. Of course, the body has weight, usually at a neutral buoyancy, and there will be a certain buoyancy, much less, of course, in aerated water. There's going to be undercurrents. There's going to be debris at this point, uh, if not the dam itself. And when we put all these together, uh, the human body is really being tortured uh, from what too far here from torture from different directions, and the net result is is a torque or a rotation, a counterclockwise rotation, uh, as you see here. 
And once you get into that rotation, uh, you pretty much lose control of yourself. And trying to go out horizontally uh, from one, from the center of the dam to one edge or the other is virtually impossible because of the of the disorientation. Uh, people who have survived this have talked about this to me, and that's something that I, I, I wouldn't want to over uh, that I wouldn't want to experience. And here we see a, a a canoe that was battered in one situation where a father and his son. Uh, went over one of these things on the Perky Oman River in uh, Pennsylvania in 2000. Uh, needless to say, neither one survived this after capsizing. <clears throat> uh, the hydraulics. There are four or five cases here of hydraulics. The first one uh, is case, case B here, uh, where you have medium flow, medium tailwater condition, uh, medium hazard, but uh, uh, sort of an optimum perfect hydraulic jump where the tail water is exactly equal to the, uh, the sequent depth of the hydraulic jump. Uh, in case C here, in case C here, uh, the tail water exceeds the, uh, uh, the sequent depth of the hydraulic jump and basically is submerging the perfect hydraulic jump, the ideal hydraulic jump. And this is the most dangerous case of all these four. Uh, in case D here, if we look at case D, here's a situation where case C uh, tailwater has completely uh, drowned out the hydraulic jump. And the, the danger of this, one, this particular case here is not very great uh, because uh, you may get uh, some undulations of water here, but uh, you basically can't Basically, uh, the hydraulic jump doesn't doesn't uh, uh, occur anymore. Um, this case here in the next slide is uh, one where a lot of people in the summertime visit, uh, jump, even jump off these dams, uh, where there's made some, pretty much a trickle, very low flow, very low tailwater, very low hazard, unless one jumps off and hits your head uh, against a rock, which has happened occasionally, and that gets chalked up as a, as a totality of low head dam, uh, perhaps shouldn't, but it does anyway. So why do people drown at these things? First of all, they're invited uh, an attraction. People are attracted to water. Uh, water sports is growing, as I mentioned. Um, there's a lack of awareness of the hazard by most people. Uh, not everyone is a hydraulic engineer and uh, just not familiar with uh, the forces that moving water uh, has. Uh, public perception of right to access I have a right to the water, uh, and no sign or no buoy or warning system is going to is going to keep us out. Reckless behavior uh, is also a problem. We have people um, going in the water doing really dumb things, as we see here uh, in this next slide. Here we see a, a, a young man uh, uh, dangling his uh, his a young boy, actually an infant, over the waterfall. Now, this way it didn't happen to be during a very high flow, but still, it's, it's a dangerous situation. Here on the right, you see uh, a boat that's about to actually climb the, uh, the hydraulic jump. Uh, this is the most dangerous situation here. And as we look at the next slide uh, on the right here, here he is uh, approaching the wall. And um, it's, it's incredible that he actually made it up there. I have a video, but we're not going to show the video here. So there are a number of reasons why people uh, drown, uh, in addition to reckless behavior, the inability to swim, over overestimating their ability, uh, external human factors, and a surprise to boaters. Here you're looking at a Perky Omen River, and where I'm putting my arrow here is a, is a low-head dam. But a father and son uh, in the morning hours, a little bit of fog, uh, we're, we're not able to see this, and therefore uh, uh, went over the dam and, and ended up drowning at it get to the next slide. This is the one I'm talking about. When they got to this point, they ended up at this, uh, at, at, the, uh, uh, at the hydraulic. Uh, question for you all out there. Can you see the, the dam ahead on the left-hand picture? Uh, you can if you look closely on the horizon. Uh, this is that bridge in, uh, that I mentioned uh, earlier uh, with a culvert where the, uh, uh, where the hydraulic jump formed on the apron downstream. Uh, folks are canoeing down here. Uh, only see smooth water going through here and don't uh, are not able to discern the, the danger that lurks on the other side of this bridge. 
people have uh, died at this uh, this crossing here. At this same place, uh, here's the boil line. Uh, here's a rescue attempt at one of the drownings at, at this particular structure. Uh, a case study as we uh, kind of wind down here. Uh, let's look. Actually, this is not the case study. Uh, the next one is a case study. This is an example. Uh, this is a uh, six-foot high dam uh, formed by uh, just a rectangular thin section here. It may be concrete. A two-foot head over uh, gives almost 10 cubic feet per second per foot for length of dam. The, uh, at this point here, at the orange uh, uh, dot, the, the plunge velocity is about 15 feet per second. is occurring 3.9, almost 4 feet below the top. So if anybody is bobbing up and down at this point, uh, he's ex experiencing water falling at the rate of 15 feet per second. And from impulse momentum relationships, if you recall, uh, force is equal to the density of water, which is 1.935. Uh, times the uh, area that this waterfall falls on a human body, uh, approximately uh, uh, eight tenths of a square foot, uh, times the velocity squared. And you can do the math on this, 1.935 times 0.8 square feet times 15 feet per second squared gives almost 350 pounds falling on the head and torso of a human body. So in a, in a highly aerated zone here, uh, it's almost impossible to uh, to keep your head above water, uh, so that's why a lot of people drown. Now, multiply by that by the fact that there's surface water uh, going in the opposite direction here, from right to left, from the boil point to this point, flowing at uh, about six feet per second. Six feet per second. Uh, how does that compare with some swimmers that we're familiar with? For instance, uh, Phelps, Michael Phelps at the Olympic. Uh, uh, 2008 Olympics, uh, one with uh, about 6.4 feet per second in his 200 meter freestyle. My poor uh, uh, granddaughter uh, who uh, uh, swims about 4.7 feet per second on a 50 meter freestyle wouldn't have a chance. As a matter of fact, neither would, would Michael Phelps have a chance uh, at, going back one slide, at this point either because of the aeration and because of all the other uh, forces and distractions and uh, and things that are uh, acting on his body. <clears throat> this is an example I wanted to talk about. This dam here is on the Rear Tan River in New Jersey near Elizabethton. Uh, these are the conditions that existed on uh, April the 12th, 1996, uh, when a uh, would-be rescuer tried to rescue his buddy who had just gone over uh, the ki on a kayak. The canoeer made it through the uh, system here and ended up downstream here uh, a couple hundred yards. His buddy started going over the dam in a kayak and got caught in, the, uh, in, in this area here. The canoeer uh, immediately started paddling up here, of course was immediately pushed towards the dam. Uh, long story short, uh, the would-be rescuer uh, in his canoe uh, capsized, overturned, thrown into the water, and drowned. Um, as a matter of fact, after this incident, there, have been, there were two or three other uh, similar drownings, including a jet skier who tried to go up the uh, up this plane like uh, like the boat uh, I showed you in an earlier picture. Um, the flow was about 2,000 cfs. Um, the unit, this was a 200 foot uh, uh, long uh, dam, so uh, about 10 cubic feet per second per foot, and um, the, on the, in the hydraulics, uh, we had about uh, 13 feet per second overflowing uh, squared times uh, 0.8 square feet times uh, um, times rho 1.935 gives about 250 pounds on the overflow. The jet at the bottom was about 22 feet per second, and that translates using um, Hans Luthizer's charts from his research that he did in, in 2001. And that's one of the, uh, the references that, uh, that I provided you. You can, you can go through this yourself. Uh, based on 22 feet per second, uh, the, and for the fruit number here, it was about almost five coming into the uh, system. Based on that fruit number and that velocity and the submergence ratio of 0.85 for this tailwater and for the, uh, uh, for the sequence, the calculated sequence depth of the hydraulic jump, uh, 
gives a, a submergence of 0.85. Uh, the backflow or the cross current is about five feet per second. So you can see why nobody has a chance in these kinds of situations. Now I've gone through here uh, pretty quickly, and I have, there's no intent here to go into great details. Uh, we'd be spending all day here if we went. Uh, we spent it on the and all just on the hydraulics alone. Uh, so in this particular case, this this example, uh, this is the way it existed on the day of the drowning. Uh, since then, and Paul's going to uh, expand on on this kind of uh, solution, uh, remediation, um, at a at a price of about 25 to percent, to about 30 percent of the original cost of one and a half uh, a million to two million dollars. Uh, this was fixed using stepped uh, uh, using a, a stepping a gradual stepping system, so that the energy was dissipated in small steps rather than one, as we see here. Okay, I'm going to have to uh, move on towards the end. I wanted to uh, draw your attention to the fact that there uh, um, there are protocols and risk management approaches to uh, to dealing with these hazards. And the one I'm showing you here in this slide, and, and I invite you to go to uh, the Canadian Dam Association's uh, uh, website, and they have a uh, there's a uh, there's a publication. Uh, that, that deals with public safety at, uh, at, at dams. And uh, I invite you to get a copy of that. It's a nominal cost. And it goes through the protocols, particularly if you own a dam or you own a series of dams. It gives you uh, a protocol for identifying the hazards, analyzing the risk, and then evaluating those risks. And uh, it goes through a system, systemized uh, method for coming up with solutions, uh, a very good uh, publications. Uh, there are many, many uh, options and alternatives available for uh, mitigating the, both the hazard, that is, taking care of the problem, the source of the problem itself, as well as, as the risk, that is, separating people from the hazard, uh, minimizing the, the risk, uh, including education, uh, uh, physical, actual physical barriers, science, and, and things like this. Uh, I'm going to leave uh, that up to uh, uh, my partner here, uh, Paul who will expand on, on some of these uh, alternatives and methods. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, turn this back to our moderator uh, and host, uh, Sean. Great. Thank you very much. We have now reached the first question and answer segment. One question that, that came up, uh, does the increased aeration at the bottom of the spillway result in loss of buoyancy? Uh, yes, it does. Very much so. As a matter of fact, they're related. Um, I have tested this myself, and the published values are uh, up to about 30 percent, or about a third. So, if a person is neutrally buoyant, uh, you really don't stand a chance in this zone, uh, in, in this aeration zone, immediately below the overfall. All right. Well, I'm going to take over now. We've kind of covered how important this problem is, and according to Dr. Schantz's statistics, there are four times as many fatalities, or more than four times as many fatalities. Uh, at low head dams or at dams than there are because of dam failures. And uh, I would speculate that the, the statistics on drownings at dams is rather incomplete. Uh, Dr. Schantz does a great job. In fact, I think he's about the only one that's really keeping track of this. And there, there is no system in place to collect this data. He pretty much mined it and people email him the statistics and things like that. So it could be even worse than we think it is. I'd like to, uh, in my presentation, I broke it down into five parts. Talk a little bit about legislation and regulation. How, how do the states address this? Uh, a little bit on dam owner liability, improving public awareness, and then getting into passive measures. And we're talking about what are things that it doesn't actually correct the problem, but it, it mitigates um, maybe access to the dangerous areas and things like that. And then close it off with some structural me measures. How can we actually fix the problem? Uh, so that, that the hazard is greatly diminished. As uh, Dr. Schantz mentioned, we both wrote a paper, and his paper covers a lot of the theory. Why is this such a problem? What are the physics and the hydraulics that are going on and some very important statistics to just to illustrate how, how big a problem it is? And then I followed up with a uh, paper on what can we really do about it, and that's what the subject of my talk is. I want to start with a little bit on legislation and regulation. 
And as far as I know, Pennsylvania is the only state in the United States that actually has a law or that has uh, enacted a law requiring dam owners of run-of-the-river dams or low-head dams to um, do something special. And in this case, the uh, House Bill Number 10 and, and, and the public law, what they have some specific requirements for these uh, dam owners of run-of-the-river dams to post warning signs and, in some cases, buoys uh, just to inform the public of the hazards at the dam. And it's a requirement um, by law. And if you go to the uh, Fish and Boat Commission website, they even have a listing of about, I think it's between 200 and 250 dams that have been identified in the state of Pennsylvania that are run of the river dams and that um, this law applies to, where, where they've actually identified the reverse roller as a significant hazard and that required this kind of uh, signage. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, I do have one regret. When we set up the webinar, you know, we titled it uh, Improving Public Safety at Low Head Dams. But the things that Dr. Schaaf talked about, the hydraulics, and a lot of the uh, things I'm going to talk about, and in fact, some of the case studies, the, these fatalities can occur at larger dams as well, especially at the spillways, because the hydraulics that occur at the low head dams can also occur at spillways. So what we're, we're talking about here really applies to, um, although it's primarily low head dams, it does apply to larger dams as well. And just an example, here is, here is one where um, two people uh, were pulled towards the spillway at Fort Loudon Dam. This is a recent occurrence. This has happened in June of 2013. It's interesting that the responders said that when they, when they heard of this, they thought it was just going to be a recovery operation because this has happened before at this particular spillway. Uh, as I mentioned in Pennsylvania, the, along with that that law, and you can go online and uh, go to the website and get a copy of the law. It, it's very specific, and it has some sign and buoy guidelines for run of the river dams. And you can go to that website, and it gives you uh, very specific instructions on where the signs need to be located, usually one at each abutment facing upstream and downstream, and then one upstream of the dam, and then one downstream of the dam, and then some, uh, also some guidelines on where to place the buoys. There are other states that have uh, some uh, requirements. For example, Virginia, they've uh, identified this as a big problem and in their code. Uh, just, just to read the, the highlighted red part, it says, any owner of a low head dam who marks a low head dam in accordance with this subsection shall be deemed to be, have met the duty of care for warning the public of the hazards posted by the dam. And anyone who doesn't do that is deemed not to have met that standard of care. So there, and what happens if you don't uh, post signs or, or meet that standard of care? Here's an example. It says the jury finds the city of Lexington in Virginia negligent for not warning the drowning victim. And when that gets to uh, court, um, you know that that is a, a factor in in how the case is handled. So as dam inspectors and designers and as dam owners, um, it, it's, I think it's very important to understand these requirements so that um, uh, we, we understand what the law says and, and also what, what the requirements are. Now, that there, there's really very little legislation and regulation of these structures, and Dr. Schantz uh, talked about this as well. But just because there isn't specific legislation and regulation doesn't mean that the dam owner is not uh, responsible. And I want to talk just a little bit about dam owner liability. And uh, I, I'm not a, an attorney, but I, I have been involved in providing litigation support on um, a number of these low-head dam incidents. And fortunately, the Association of Dam Safety Officials has saw a great need for dam owners to understand their responsibilities. So they engaged um, an attorney, Dennis Binder, who also did an excellent webinar uh, a couple of months ago on this topic and spoke uh, for two hours on the legal liability for dam uh, owners and uh, related to failures and other incidents. And the association has uh, prepared some really excellent documents 
for dam owners so they can understand their responsibilities and liability. And then there are also some really quick fact sheets, like Pennsylvania has a number of fact sheets, and one of them is on this subject. So if you want a quick primer on legal responsibilities, these are some excellent resources to go to. I did summarize the key issues in just a couple of slides. And uh, your dam owners, what are they responsible for? They're responsible to make and keep the premises safe. Um, they are responsible to avoid conduct or conditions that could injure any person, even trespassers, even trespassers. And uh, they're also responsible to correct existing dangerous conditions and to post warnings. And when there is a problem, you know, what are the liability issues as they relate to public safety? And I summarized the four major ones here. One is that there, if there is a failure to warn or guard the public against injury from a dangerous condition that was known or should have been known. And Dr. Sean did an excellent job explaining what those uh, dangerous conditions can be. If there's a a failure to properly construct or maintain in good repair any structure, or if there's a failure to properly control potentially hazardous recreational activities. And again, that even includes trespassers. There's also if the owner must identify any unreasonably dangerous condition and warn potential victims of the existence of the condition within a reasonable period. And lastly, the owner does not have to ensure against the possibility of injury but must act reasonably to prevent the possibility of injury. So these last two slides are really a, a, a the Reader's Digest version of some of the owner liability um, uh, documents that, that I had shown you earlier. And uh, in most cases, what, what we found is that the owners of these uh, low head dams uh, are uh, take action after an incident has occurred. And, uh, but I'm finding more and more, as uh, dam owners understand their risks and exposure, that they're starting to take action before there is an incident. And, and that, that's, that's a good thing. And, and hopefully, uh, uh, education like the webinar we have today will, will help simulate that. Now, wh what do you do about it? Uh, one approach is to improve public awareness. And as Dr. Schwantz mentioned, these dams um, have become destinations. And the, the popularity of different kinds of sports and activities around these dams has just grown exponentially. And I think if you go back and study some of Dr. Schwantz's statistics, you'll see that there is a trend. And the trend is that the number of drownings at these dams is increasing decade by decade. And the last decade is, is just going up uh, at an alarming rate. And a lot of this is because of the popularity and the growing uh, popularity of uh, paddling sports and, and just people wanting to go out and recreate on the rivers. I, one of the things I often do after inspecting a dam is I'll go online and I'll type in the name of the dam just to see if there are any YouTube videos or newspaper articles or anything else uh, related to the dam. And it's not uncommon uh, to find something like this. I, I was inspecting this particular dam, and th there it was in uh, the local newspaper. It says, despite the rules, teens cool off at Beaver Dam Reservoir. And what you don't see in the picture is in the foreground, there's all kinds of signs uh, warning trespassers not to uh, enter the property, as well as some pretty significant barriers that you have to climb around in order to get to this uh, pedestrian bridge that leads to the tower. Uh, another thing that, that uh, happens a lot is uh, you know, you'll go to a water park and you can pay 5 or $10 to uh, play uh, with boogie boards on a, uh, a man-made water slide or hydraulic. And uh, I think when the general public goes out and looks at one of these low head dams, they look very attractive. And they just don't understand that the, the conditions are different. And here's a case in Pennsylvania where uh, two young men, very healthy, age 20, and 18 went out with their boogie boards on a, a low head dam, and uh, they both drowned as well. And as Bruce mentioned, a lot of times it, it, it find, these incidents don't make front page news. They're very deep in the paper on page B3. And that who are the trespassers that are, are going to these dams? Um, a lot of times it can be very small children. And you know the question is, are signs enough? You know, are they even able to understand the hazards? 
or just people wanting to uh, uh, go out and, and fish. And another thing that's quite deceptive is that you could be at a dam on one day and, uh, for example, you could be at this dam and the flow over the dam is so, so small that even birds can wade on top of the dam and, uh, you know, they're not washed off. So th this is a, a relatively safe place to be in and it could be a place for a lot of fun for kids to play and stuff like that. But give them just a little bit more rain and the situation can change dramatically. This is a, the exact same dam after a rainfall event and uh, the hazards are obvious. It's also been the site of, uh, of drownings. Um, and as, as Bruce mentioned too, people do take risks and sometimes they, they, they do some dumb things. I just put a couple of pictures of things that I've seen as I've inspected dams and uh, you know, with the children and even adults just taking unnecessary risks at these structures and, uh, you know, not understanding um, the hazards. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it just shows dam owners the need that, that they have to uh, control access sometimes to their facilities and to warn the public and, uh, you know, to, to reduce their exposure to liability as well. And this is kind of the last slide on that topic, and it, it really shows how bad things can get. I was inspecting this dam, and then I got online afterwards, and I, I was really surprised to see uh, the extent. Uh, somebody actually created a website, and on that website, they tell you how to get to the dam. They provide a map. They show you, if you look down here, it It, it, this is all happening. This isn't at a low head dam. This is at a spillway of a dam, and it shows you, you know, where you can put in, and you can see Kenny and Butch having a good time in the spillway. It even says at the bottom here that this is the play spot for Southern Illinois, and it gives uh, people instructions on on how to get there, when the best time to get there is, and uh, all that. And uh, I remember showing this to the owner as part of the closeout meeting for the inspection, and they were totally unaware uh, that this had become a hot spot for or a real destination for this kind of recreation. And this has also been the site of uh, at least one drowning. So what, what can you do? Um, at a minimum, you can install warning signs. These are typical signs that are used in Pennsylvania. They were developed following uh, the enactment of that public law. And uh, there's usually one sign like this required at each abutment facing in both directions. And then there's all, this is a, you don't have to come up with your own sign. Uh, I think this is kind of tried and true. And, and it's, a, it's a good uh, sign that you can just purchase. They're, they're pre-made and um, you can order them so you don't have to do any design work. And uh, this is kind of a close-up. This is the sign that goes on the upstream and the downstream side. They're uh, four feet by four feet, and you can see the color scheme and the size of the lettering and all that. Um, other states have seen the need, though, to go even further and start putting graphics on the signs. And, for example, in Minnesota, where they have a lot of um, migrant workers and people that, that some, in some cases just don't have the ability to read or uh, they, they don't understand English, um, they'll put graphics on the sign to help illustrate the uh, hazards. And in some cases, they'll put it in other languages as well. And it's important with these signs to really convey the dangers and the hazards that exist. For example, at this particular dam, um, it, not only do they warn of the danger, but they inform them, inform them that 15 people have drowned at this dam. And after the posting of this dam, there were three more people uh, that drowned. And in some cases, too, where you have hydro uh, facilities, the release of water can be sporadic so that it's, um, it's not just after a rainfall event. It could be episodic where they turn on the turbines, and that's what creates the uh, hazardous condition downstream. And in cases like that, again, here are just some examples of some signs that I've seen where uh, you know the dam owner is trying to convey the message of the danger and the need to warn, and they've even gone the extent of going beyond just placing signs, but also installing sirens so that they can inform the people downstream. And, and here's an example of a siren installation downstream of Conowingo Dam in uh, 
uh, right at the border of Pennsylvania and Maryland on the Susquehanna River. And in this case, whenever the release uh, water for generating hydropower, um, they have a siren that goes off and it warns boaters and people in the water that the water levels and the flow conditions are about to change. And an example of, uh, uh, this is a, a fairly recent case, it was in 2012, where a man and a woman were in their boat downstream of the dam and they were approaching the dam to uh, go fishing and then uh, the uh, sluice gate was open to release water and uh, that's what the boat looked like afterwards. It was not designed for that kind of flow condition and the uh, occupants were very fortunate that they did not lose their lives. It says that warning signs were posted above and below all of the dams owned by the Corps and the TVA of the extreme danger of operating a small boat near a dam during water releases and, and that it can't be uh, overemphasized. And in this case, the two individuals were very uh, fortunate. Now, when you do post signs um, to, to warn people of the dam downstream or upstream, I, I don't know, can you see the signs in this picture? Uh, for one thing, is the signs are very small. Uh, there's one over here to the right and then there's another one over here to the left. If I was paddling down this river, I'm not so sure I'd be looking, you know, side to side, uh, looking for these signs, so they, they really need to stand out. And uh, it, it's a big maintenance issue as well, that once you post the signs, you really do have to maintain them. They have to be visible. Uh, just like anything, signs wear out too. In some cases, it's just the uh, natural elements that wear them out. In other cases, there could be uh, vandalism, uh, you know, people shooting them and tearing them down and things like that. I was involved in one case where there were two drownings and I was called out by the owner and walked the site with the owner after the incident. And this was a case in Pennsylvania. So the first thing I, I was looking for is where did, did the dam comply with the, um, the law and were the signs posted? And there was evidence of the signs being there, but they, they no longer existed. And as we went downstream, we, we did find some of the signs. And what had happened was during past flood events, the signs, the signs were just washed downstream. So that, that's a big maintenance issue. And then the question becomes, are signs enough? Um, they, they may meet the minimum requirements of some state laws, but uh, when, when you look at the uh, owner liability, it really becomes a calculus of three things. One is the risk of occurrence, the magnitude of the harm, and then the availability of alternatives. And, uh, you know, our trespassers can also include small children, and there's a responsibility to uh, protect children from the dangers as well. Here's, here's a good example of uh, an incident that happened, and I'm, I'm not going to go through all the details on these slides. Uh, I provided a lot more information than I'm going to talk about, so if you're interested in going back afterwards and uh, looking at the presentation, you, you'll be able to read more details of, of these specific cases. But this is a case here where there's a four-year-old boy, and he went to this one uh, park with his parents, and it, it was the, the, the park, there was a, a low-head dam uh, in the middle of the park, and it says that um, it, it, what, what happened here was the four-year-old got away from his parents, he fell into the river, he got caught in the backwash or the boil at the downstream uh, side of the dam, his mother and father jumped in, and then a good Samaritan that was there also jumped in to save the boy. Ironically, the boy made it to shore, uh, but the three uh, adults all drowned uh, at the dam. And then a lawsuit filed, and the lawsuit states that this is not the first time visitors have lost their lives because of the dangerous dam. In 25 years, at least 15 people have drowned after being sucked into the dam. Part of lawsuits have failed because there was no evidence the city and park district knew of the dangerous conditions according to the lawsuit. Uh, another ironic fact about this was that uh, it appears that the city didn't even own the dam. They owned the park along the dam, but they did not own the dam. It was kind of an orphan dam. Uh, before the incident, the Wilmington officials had posted nine brightly colored four-foot by eight-foot warning signs at both entrances of the park and also near the dam, and they told of the dangerous undertow in two languages and included a painted illustration. The reason the insurer refused to renew the park's insurance was due to numerous lawsuits filed by relatives of other drowning victims 
uh, the Park District won the lawsuits but was forced to spend $180,000 in legal fees. So even if you post signs, um, you know, that doesn't eliminate the danger. It, it just provides public awareness of the danger. So what's the next thing you could do? Well, let's look at some non-structural measures. And when we talk about non-structural measures, again, we're not eliminating the problem. We're just doing additional things to prevent access and, and to make the site safer. And uh, um, there, in addition to the boil and the hydraulic um, conditions at the dam, uh, Bruce mentioned this too, that can you see the dam? And in, in some cases, especially if you're approaching the dam from the upstream side, it's often difficult to look down the horizon and see that you're about to go over the dam. And uh, at this, this is an example in uh, Pennsylvania uh, near Pittsburgh where uh, about two years before this particular incident, there was a tugboat that went over the dam and four people drowned uh, when that happened. But this particular example, uh, it was a, a case where the speedboat ran into the lock gate while going full speed and then stopped suddenly and the two occupants of the boat uh, died. Uh, according to the article, it says alcohol was suspected in the um, ramming of the lock gate. But it, it shows the importance of being able to see the dam from the upstream side. Here's an example down in Petersburg, Virginia, where a jet skier went over this dam, and then he died from his injuries uh, from the impact on the downstream side. It, it's interesting to note that in this particular case, uh, the dam was clearly marked with buoys. And uh, according to the report, it was not known why he went over the dam um, on, on the jet ski. Here's an example of a dam in Pennsylvania. It's a, an inflatable dam at Sunbury. And if, it's my understanding that there have been no drownings at this dam since it was installed. And this dam does comply with the Pennsylvania laws. They have a buoy line on the upstream side. They have the warning signs upstream and downstream. Uh, because this river here is over half a mile wide, uh, the law requires that, that there be warning actually in the river. So that's why they have the buoys. And the whole uh, concept here is to create an exclusion zone upstream of the dam and also downstream of the dam and have this whole area um, so that there's no fishing, wading, or boating uh, within the vicinity of the dam. The kind of buoys that are, are needed this is kind of a, a universal um, regulatory buoy. It's got the uh, stunt symbol that shows that there is a hazard ahead uh, and warns of the danger. So that, that's a pretty standard buoy uh, requirement. And again, this is something that you don't have to design. They're available. Uh, you can purchase them and put them in. Now, the buoys are great, signs are great, they, they kind of warn of the dangers, but what happens if your motor doesn't work or it stalls or something like that? Uh, this is a case where, where two men were fishing in Tennessee, and that, that's exactly what happened. Their motor stalled out, and they were unable to um, go upstream. The other thing you can see here is even if they were able to make it to either bank, it's a vertical wall, and there's nothing to hang on to. So it, it's like you're almost committed and you will go over the dam. They were fortunate enough here that the flow of the river was so small they were able to redistribute their weight to the back end of the boat, which caused it to get hung up on the crest of the dam. And then somebody was able to throw them a rope from the bridge and they, they were rescued. This is a case in um, Fairfax, Virginia, just outside of Washington, where the same thing happened to these uh, two fishermen. And in this case, the, their boat did go over the dam. Uh, but they were fortunate that there happened to be a pole sticking out of the crest of the spillway, and they both clung to that pole until they were rescued by, fairly dramatically, by a helicopter. Now, in that case, what the owner did was to install a buoy line upstream, and a fairly substantial buoy line. So here you can see a close-up, essentially creating a, a barrier, and there, there's even lighting on the buoy line. And uh, that's a, a very effective uh, passive way of uh, preventing that, that same incident from happening. Now it really does restrict access close to the dam, 
And if somebody was to have a mechanical failure with their boat, uh, they'd have the ability to uh, get pull themselves to to either, either side. Um, I had uh, somebody working on an O and M manual for a dam, and uh, you know they've had the buoys and, and all that stuff. And they the engineer called me up and said, "Is it okay? The owner wants to know: Is it okay to remove the buoys?" for the winter time because of the ice will come by and, and take it out. And my response was to send him this example. And it's fairly recent. It's November 20th, 2012. And it tells of uh, two men who drowned on by approaching a dam from the downstream side. I believe this was a Corps of Engineers dam. And it says the Corps of Engineers used they used buoys to warn the boaters to stay out of the area. But at the time of the accident they had removed the buoys for the winter. So I think the answer to the question is I wouldn't remove the buoys. If they get washed out from uh, ice flows and things like that, I'd just go back in and replace them afterwards. And what was the result of this? Uh, there were lawsuits. There was compensation and damages. And the reason was the warning buoys had been removed for the winter at the time. So just like signs that need to be maintained, uh, buoy systems also need to be maintained. And uh, it requires some vigilance. I, I recommend that dam owners, if they have signs and buoys, uh, once they're installed, that they have extras available so that if there is a flood event or something like that uh, that occurs and, uh, um, and, and they get damaged, they can go in immediately and replace them. And part of their O&M strategy or, or uh, you know, sta standard operating procedures for these facilities should be that, that after a flood event, they go out and they check to make sure that the signs and the buoys and other features uh, are still intact. Here's a, a dam on the uh, Schuylkill River in Pennsylvania, and uh, just down in Philadelphia. And it's along. Uh, a lot of people know this as they drive the Schuylkill Expressway. They can look over to the left and they see it's a uh, boathouse row. And in the uh, picture down here in the inset, uh, they often have special days where they allow the general public to come and try all kinds. The vendors come with their kayaks and canoes and watercraft. And they let novices go out there and play in the river and try things out. Uh, so you have a lot of un inexperienced uh, paddlers out there. And immediately downstream, you have Fairmont Dam. And you can see by the debris that's caught in the tow here that that, that is a significant uh, hazard. And the hydraulic roller is, is uh, strong. And what they did at this dam is they strung a cable across from one side of the river to the other side of the river. And then dangling from the main cable, are a series of other cables that, that are draped across. And they essentially form a wall of cables so that uh, you can see the buoy here in the upstream side that warns of the dam downstream. And if they lose control or they drop their paddles or whatever, um, they get a second chance to grab onto a cable and then get rescued from that. So that's, that's what that one dam owner did. Now, you still have a problem about exiting that even if you were able to get to the riverbank, in many cases, the banks are near vertical. So that if you did have um, the opportunity to, you're warned, you go to the bank. And once you get to the bank, you see that you know, you've got nothing to hang on to. And uh, there's no way to get out. That can be a problem. So a, a, another passive system could be to install a ladder or uh, just some way to exit uh, upstream of the dam. And it, this is also important for first responders that have to uh, respond to incidents at a, at a dam to have a certain amount of facilities in place to allow them to launch boats and to install the equipment that they need to uh, effectively rescue somebody that may become trapped at one of these facilities. For example, here, uh, you know, just upstream of the dam, this is a vertical wall. It's, it's good to have a ladder so that somebody, at least they could escape uh, if they're caught in the system. And it is a double-edged sword because now you also have an access into this area as well. But it, it's something to consider. Even better is to warn people before they approach the dam, in fact, long before they approach the dam, that there is a dam downstream, and to install a, a portage facility. So here's uh, an example on uh, the riverbank where uh, the owner has put in a place where kayakers can um, exit, and then they can carry their kayaks around the dam. 
And uh, I'll leave this with you, but there's all kinds of uh, guidelines available for dam owners that, that want to take this approach. It gives them uh, some guidance on how far upstream to notify the uh, kayakers or boaters or, or people that are tubing. It notifies them that there is a dam downstream, that there is a opportunity to portage, what side of, of the river the portage facilities are, and uh, you know that kind of information. And then it, you know it's important that they know about it so that in addition to putting signs at the banks, um, if there is an over uh, a bridge spanning over the river, that's a great place to hang a warning sign um, telling people that there is a dam downstream and that there's also an opportunity to exit to the left or the right and to um, use a, the portage facility. And if there are no bridges, you can string a cable across the uh, riverway or the uh, stream and uh, just suspend it above uh, the river so they can see it. And important to mark you know, where they can pull out, where the portage facilities are. Um, so portage is, is another passive way of dealing with the hazard. And then uh, another one is to try to create barriers or fencing or, or things like that to exclude people from having access uh, to, to the dam. This is an example of some fencing uh, involved in rehabilitating a dam for uh, Pennsylvania State University. And at this particular dam, uh, they, there's a lot of student activity. They have concrete canoe races, and, and hundreds of kids come out here to uh, compete and to recreate and things like that. And uh, um, at, and at one of these gatherings, uh, some a, a young man decided to, I guess, show off a little bit, and he dove in the four bay area of the spillway off the abutment, not realizing that the depth of flow uh, in the Forbay area was less than three feet, and uh, he died because of his injuries. But uh, it, it, it was uh, interesting to see how serious the university took to uh, um, creating uh, fencing and, and making the area very safe so that nobody could fall in. And just an example, in addition to the four post handrails, a uh, chain link fence was installed over just to make sure nobody could fall and slip through. And absolutely every nook and cranny uh, was closed off just to make the premises as safe as possible. You know, in many cases, that, that kind of exclusion is you can't put fences everywhere. Uh, but some fencing is probably better than no fencing at all, especially um, at least to cover the most hazardous uh, locations on the dam. And here, for example, uh, just fencing at the abutments of the dam um, at least provides some protection from falling in. Uh, something else, to, and, and Bruce did mention this too, it, it isn't just, there really needs to be a lot of education, not just to the general public, but also to first responders. In this picture, these are um, some uh, water rescue experts. They've got all the gear, they've got the helmets, they've got their um, special boats, they've got life jackets and wetsuits, and during this training exercise one of them drowned because they did not understand the phenomenon of this reverse roller, the hydraulics, and, and, and just the death trap that it can be. And as Dr. Schantz mentioned, even um, Michael Phelps can't swim fast enough to escape a situation like this. Uh, in, in, a pe in a paper by uh, Kevin Elvram, he put this statistic in there. It said, in 1980, Ohio DNR officials were dismayed to learn that in two years, nine firefighters and police officers in that state lost their lives in fast water rescue attempts. And I believe most of them were trying to rescue uh, drowning victims at low head dams. So it's important that they understand the hazards. And uh, as they can put themselves in harm's way as well, trying to respond to uh, an emergency at a dam. And it's important that not only they understand the hazards, but they understand how to approach the situation and that they be equipped with the right gear. Uh, fortunately, there are resources out there. There's an excellent paper by Kenneth Wright, and he is all dedicated towards uh, providing the emergency rescue approach at low head dams. And, uh, uh, I have a couple of pictures here where, in this case, it wasn't a rescue attempt. It was a, re a body recovery uh, at a dam near Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, another low head dam. And you can see 
that the uh, rescuers have all the right gear, but you also see the ropes attached to the front end and the back of the boat. And uh, this is all covered in Ken Rice paper. They're really following the right approach so that they have full control over this watercraft at all times, that it can't get sucked up against the dam and overturn. Um, you can see that, the, again, the cabling from one side to the other side. This is a second boat. So there, it's a, there are two boats here working together um, to recover the body. And in this case, it was a, a young man and, and uh, his girlfriend. They were recreating upstream. They had their little dog with them. And the dog jumped out of the boat. And the woman jumped in after the dog. And then she and the dog went over the dam. But, but the woman drowned. But uh, one of the things that, that may be considered, uh, another passive uh, modification at the dam is to provide um, access. For example, here at both abutments of the dam, it's a vertical wall. So they have ladders there um, and also places to tie off ropes and, and things like that just to make um, rescuing more effective. Also important to have the right equipment and that, you know, here you can, one of the important things is that um, any person that you'd be able to retrieve them, in, in this case the uh, first responder has a vest and he also has a rope tethered to him so that they're able to retrieve them. Uh, when, when the first responders do have to respond, there are different ways to do it. There's a shore-based rescue, there's air-based, and then there's a, a boat-based rescue. Um, some examples here, in this case it was a family of uh, four and uh, there was even a baby on board. N nobody was wearing life jackets and it was a case where they did not see the crest of the dam downstream. Uh, so they went over the dam and you can see what happened. They initially tried a shore-based rescue where they had a fire truck with an extending ladder and it, it could not reach, but what they were able to do is throw life jackets into the water and uh, they were, until everybody in the boat had a life jacket, and then they followed it up with an air-based rescue, and they had a helicopter come in one by one, uh, rescue the people from the boat. Uh, other shore-based rescue uh, equipment that's available for first responders are, are things like a line gun, so they could shoot a rope across, and then it, it, the person, if they're able to, can grab on and they can pull them to safety or to have throw lines or things like that available uh, to assist in the rescue attempt. Uh, another common rescue approach is to use a, a fire hose and to inflate it with uh, pressurized air and then to string it out and float it across uh, so you're able to reach um, the victim. And I'd like to uh, end now with the last um, part of the presentation, and that's what can we do to eliminate, essentially eliminate the hazards at these low head dams? A lot of them, when they were built, um, you know, this was not an issue. It, was, it wasn't even a consideration that it could be a, a public hazard. Uh, another thing is that a lot of these dams, and, and Bruce did a great job talking about mill dams, many of them are now orphan dams. That is, nobody knows who owns them. They just kind of are there and nobody's taking care of them, and uh, it, the, the hazard exists. And for many of these dams, it just makes sense to remove them. In Pennsylvania, between 1997 and 2013, uh, the Fish and Boat Commission and the state uh, Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection were very aggressive at dealing with this problem. And between that time period, they removed over 211 dams, and they're continuing uh, this effort today. Uh, they've got an expedited permit approach where um, they essentially pay for everything. If, if the owner decides they want to remove the dam, in most cases, the, the finances will be uh, identified. Uh, and even more importantly, the permit process is expedited to allow uh, dam removals to take place. So that, that's kind of a, a positive thing. So removing dams is, is a, a very effective solution. You've, you've removed the hazard. But there are many dams that that is just not the option. And uh, Dr. Schantz talked about the different flow conditions. And really, you know, case A, case B, and case D, are, are the, the, the hydraulic hazard is really small. It's not until you get to this plunging nap and you get the reverse roller that you get 
the problem. So it's important for engineers to understand what is the problem and how can we fix it. It's also a transient condition. So it's not something that's out there all the time. It, it, it happens as the flow changes from a low flow to all of a sudden you get this plunging map, and uh, that's when the hazard occurs. Then we get more flow. It's, it's uh, completely submerged, and it's no longer a hazard. So what can we do as engineers to fix this problem? for dams that have to stay? Well, there are really three approaches. One is to raise or lower the dam crest. And you could do that with an inflatable dam or a bascule gate or something like that. But that means you have to understand what's going on and program it and stuff like that. And that, that's probably not a very uh, effective way of dealing with it. Uh, another way is to modify the tailwater. And one way to do that is to build more dams downstream, but then you're just creating more hazards. So the most common method is to modify the downstream face and to dissipate the energy or just just to modify it so you don't get this hydraulic roller. Um, one way to do that is to create a baffled chute. Now this this is uh, pretty effective at dissipating energy and this is what it might look like. And uh, here's one in action and you can see it, it there's there's no hydraulic jump at the toe because all the energy is dissipated on the chute. So for anybody approaching the dam from the downstream side, there's probably very little chance of them getting caught in a hydraulic roller and getting sucked up against the dam because it, it just doesn't exist. But I'm not too sure I'd want to go over the top of the dam. Uh, it, it'd be a pretty, uh, a pretty hazardous ride downstream. Now here's a, another approach. Uh, at this dam, you can see this is the before picture. And then after, what, what was done here is to put in very large boulders in the downstream face. And, and I need to say that there is no place where you can go to and find a manual on how to uh, retrofit a low head dam. There, that is, is a real need for more research, but I'm just showing you things that others have done that appear to be fairly effective. And in this case, they, they filled it with, it's not dumped rock, it's, it's carefully placed rock. And it's a little deceptive here. These boulders are very large. They're between uh, three to six feet in diameter. And uh, the, the question is, what slope do you, do you place this at? And most of the literature that I've seen uh, recommend uh, at least a four horizontal to one vertical slope with this rock fill. So that was the rock placed, uh, the previous slide was immediately after it was placed. After a while, all the openings and stuff get filled in with uh, leaves and, and silt. And this is what it looks like several years afterwards. And it effectively eliminates the hydraulic roller hazard. And this is the kind of boulders we're talking about when we put them uh, in place. They're very large, you know, three feet to six feet in diameter, weighing between 4,000 and 10,000 pounds apiece. And when you place them, you need some special equipment to do that. Here, here's the most common approach where you have a uh, track hoe, and it's got a special um, claw at the end with a thumb. So they're essentially taking them one stone, large stone at a time, and working them in and placing them downstream of the dam. I, I wish I could have showed you the uh, video I have of this dam where they were half done, and then it rained, and the water was going over. It was very clear how effective the boulders are at eliminating the roller, because half the dam had that roller, and you could just see it occurring on the downstream side. And the half that had the boulders, uh, that roller was completely eliminated. At another dam, where they did kind of the same thing, uh, at this dam, there was a problem with undermining and um, scouring and, and things like that. And the, the concern was just putting in large boulders that people might walk out and get their feet caught in it, and that there'd be another hazard there. And since we were fixing the dam as well, they decided to slush grout the, the large boulders after they were placed. And you can see that operation going on here. And that's what it looked like when it was all completed. So now all the boulders um, are essentially one big mass, and they're all slush grouted, and the hydraulic roller is eliminated. Uh, Dr. Schantz mentioned this one here, um, where this is the before picture. The dam was built in 1995 within Three years, there were four drownings. And the solution to that dam was to build a series of stair steps on the downstream side. And I, I understand that these were precast concrete steps that were anchored into place uh, to create, um, to, infill, to modify the downstream side of the dam and eliminate the hydraulic roller. At this dam in uh, New Bethlehem, uh, we were called in to, uh, you can see how deteriorated it is and, and needed rehabilitation. 
But while we were there, we uh, learned that it was also a site of at least one drowning, and that the hydraulic roller was an obvious uh, feature at this dam during certain flow conditions. So the concept was to do something similar. In this case, we used reinforced concrete to uh, uh, modify the downstream face of the dam. That was the, sorry, the artist's rendering. And then this is the, the finished dam. And uh, it was very effective anticipating the energy and eliminating the hydraulic roller at the, uh, at the dam. Uh, here's an example where they did a little bit of both. And this is in Denver, Colorado. Here they have the concrete steps, but they also roughened up the surface of the steps by including large boulders on the steps, uh, possibly to improve the aesthetics, but as well as to dissipate the energy. So it's kind of like that baffled chute, but they're using boulders and a concrete uh, step. I understand that uh, you can also use uh, uh, concrete-filled bags or grout bags. Uh, that, that avoids the dewatering and, and things like that. Um, there are two other ways to deal with this that I'm aware of where there's ongoing research, and this is Ed Kern from Brigham Young University. He's doing physical model studies to do a modified flip lib des lid design uh, to prevent the upstream uh, surface velocities. So you can go to his website and see where he's at with that research. In Europe, uh, where they've had some drownings at these kind of crest gates, uh, they've, someone has invented something called a safety slide. And uh, you can see it's like a floating raft on the downstream side, and that prevents uh, the hydraulic roller. They've got all kinds of videos showing how effective that is. Now, I'd like to just wrap up in my last five minutes uh, on what I think might be the ultimate solution, and, and one that I'm pretty excited about. And Dr. Luther Adling from the uh, Minnesota Department of Natural Resources published two years ago a, uh, a manual and it's titled Reconnecting Rivers, Natural Channel Design in Dam Removal and Fish Passage. And this reference is available for free. You can download the PDF file. And what Dr. Adlin has done, he's, he's spent a lot of time researching flow conditions in rivers and at dams and wanting to come up with a solution that um, primarily addressed fish passage at dams, but at the same time uh, is very effective at making the site uh, safer for the public. When I saw his design philosophy, I thought that th this is impossible because he says he wants to be able to accommodate all migrating species all, all the time, including reptiles, amphibians, mammals, and invertebrates. So people that design fishways, uh, you'd say, boy, that's got to be impossible because you often try to focus on a target species. But his philosophy was, I want everything to be able to pass. He wants whatever there to, to provide quality uh, aquatic habitat does not like to see any kind of concrete or steel. It does not require operation and maintenance. That makes the dam owner happy. Something that emulates and functions as river habitat and that's large enough to prevent uh, bottlenecks or predation losses. Here is an example of a before picture. And you can, if you look at this house in the background as a reference, and here's the dam. This is the before. And this is the after. So here's the house again. And you can see the concept he has here. It's, it's called a nature-like fishway, or, and there are different types. There's a bypass channel, but this type is a rock ramp fishway. And you can see that this is where the dam is. And he's created a series of chevrons with very large boulders. And the slope here is not 4 to 1. It's more like a 3% or 5%, so it's much flatter. It's actually creating a natural sequence of riffles. So here's the ripples, and then the reservoir is the pool, trying to emulate what's happening naturally in the system. And if you go to his reference, you can see uh, some sketches and uh, design guidelines on how to do this. And it's three to six foot diameter field stones to make the chevrons. Uh, he has some other designs where he creates like a honeycomb pattern as well, and uh, infills the area on the downstream face of the dam. Here's just one more example of a before on the top and then an after. So it looks very natural um, afterwards. And that is also an effective way of eliminating the uh, hydraulic roller downstream. And are they effective? Well, he's gone in and done fish rodeos and uh, at, at these sites. And it looks like it's, it's a big success as far as passing minnows. And you can see turtles and crawdads and eels. And it, it seems to be the perfect solution um, both to improve public safety and also fish passage at these uh, bowhead dams. So that this might be the ultimate solution. So just in summary, um, 
these are some bullets that Dr. Shonson and I put together uh, that we believe kind of encapsulate this topic. Uh, all low head dams are potentially dangerous. And that's primarily because of the hydraulic condition that can develop on the downstream side of the dam. Uh, most people are unaware of the dangers. And uh, you know, education is very important. Dam owners are responsible for warning of hazardous conditions. You know, that's um, that's just their legal responsibility. And as I pointed out, there are a lot of methods that exist for reducing these hazards. And, and at the very end, doing nothing simply is not an option, not anymore. So um, with that. Um, I, we, we did put together some references, resources, and websites for you if you're interested in learning more. And uh, there, there's a whole lot more than just what's on this slide. And we'd encourage you to, th these are kind of the best, I think, the references that we're aware of. Uh, we'd encourage you to, to take a look at these. And uh, with that, uh, Dr. Schost and I, I think we've got about six minutes left to answer any questions you might have. Sure do. Thank you, Paul. OK. Um, one uh, attendee put down, do you have Carl Bishop's, formerly the Corps and the Department of Interior Safety Programs video entitled, Not by a Dam Site? Um, I, no, I don't have that. But uh, I know that the Association Dam Safety Officials have a number of videos. One of my favorite videos is one that was put on by our local news station here in Pennsylvania. We, we have a dam uh, on the Susquehanna River called the Dock Street Dam. And there have been 17 drownings there in the past 20 years. And they did, uh, I think, I've, in my opinion, it's the best video ever, where they took a bass boat, a John boat, and they put two dummies on board and a video camera, uh, like a waterproof one. And they, they approached the dam from the downstream side and then released it at the downstream end of the boil and, and then videotaped it being sucked up against the dam. And then that's when the video, onboard video, took over. And it just captured what happened and kind of simulated what it was like to drown at a low head dam. It's about a 20-minute video. If you go online, uh, you, can, you can see it. And uh, it's very effective. Uh, unfortunately, there are too many videos out there where people have videotaped actual drownings and rescue attempts at dams as well. So, so there's no lack of information on on this hazard. Um, Paul, Paul, this is Bruce. Go ahead, Bruce. Uh, there, someone asked uh, about discussing what federal agencies do for public safety dams, and that's a that's really a good question. Um, the, probably the, the main uh, publication for, as far as public agency is concerned, is, is put out by the uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, Guidelines for Public Safety at Hydropower Projects. Uh, this has been adopted by uh, different states to, maybe I should use the word adapted, <clears throat> by several states uh, that do have uh, some kind of guidelines for, uh, and Paul, you mentioned some of these states, for developing their own programs as far as signage is concerned, boys and, and such. Uh, there is no national uh, uh, guideline. This has become more or less a de facto guideline that other agencies have used, such as the Corps of Engineers. And I'm looking one uh, now on my desk. Uh, it's called Recreation Planning and Design Criteria, uh, dated 1987. The Bureau uh, of Reclamation has uh, uh, has put out a publication called Public Safety Around Dams and Reservoirs. Uh, this is dated 1992. Um, the, um, uh, see, I had some other, other ones here. Uh, also, the uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has put out a, a sort of a, a companion publication, uh, Safety Signage at Hydropower Projects, dated uh, October 2011. 2001, excuse me, uh, and, and TVA has, has put out its, its own uh, publication called Warning Devices and Signs. All these are really old documents, uh, and, and most of them are founded on the precepts uh, and concepts that um, were born out of the uh, FER, FERC uh, guidelines. 
But most of them don't go, do not go into the depth and detail that, uh, that we've discussed here. They're primarily limited to uh, portages and signs, fonts, distances, uh, location of signs, that kind of thing. And, and Dr. Schwartz, if I could just kind of conclude with um, some recommendations. One of the things I'm, I'm seeing more and more, uh, engineers have the responsibility of going out and inspecting a lot of these dams. And we tend to focus on the structural and the condition of the dams and uh, haven't been trained to focus on the public hazards. And I think that that needs to change. Um, you know, we have a responsibility to the dam owners to, to uh, first understand, especially the laws and regulations of the state, and uh, to help them buy down risk at some of these structures. And uh, we have a bigger and bigger role to educate um, other engineers, owners, and uh, you know, pretty much everyone that we can about the hazards at these structures. Good point. Um, and again, <clears throat> the, uh, the the public safety and the safety at dams and around dams, I think, is uh, becoming more and more important, just as the safety of dams is. Yeah. I guess, Sean, we'll turn it back to you. I think our time is up now. Yes, thank you very much. Well, with that, we will conclude today's online seminar. Today's program is copyright 2013 by the Association of State Dam Safety Officials with all rights reserved. This concludes today's program. You may now disconnect. <laughs>